Welcome, welcome everyone. Greetings. Good afternoon. I think I see a couple of good mornings, perhaps, <laughs> as well. And just in case, good evening. Um, we're so thankful to have you join us today for another round of the Ostrom uh, Colloquium series. Uh, we were just speaking uh, that this is only four to go um, after after uh, uh, counting today, actually, after today, only three, which is amazing. A couple of uh, just really quick announcements and updates. Remember, we do have a research series presentation this week. Um, with Saleh Yusin. Uh, so that's going to be really great talking about bureaucrat local uh, politician relations and hierarchical local government and emerging democracies. Next Wednesday is going to be really interesting as well. Um, just as a heads up, that's our special teaching the workshop history and methods roundtable discussion. So all of our wonderful Ostrom fellows have been working very diligently over the course of this year um, on this project. So they're going to be talking to us a little bit about, um, you know, what they've learned. We'll be highlighting some senior uh, uh, workshoppers uh, who have really honestly been teaching this stuff in some cases for decades to learn about their experiences, what's it like from the student perspective. And then we'll also update you on some of our efforts um, to build out the online offerings and modules uh, and not at, at the uh, teaching page in particular at the workshop. So that's going to be a really fun discussion. I'm looking forward to that. And you'll know that's next Wednesday, remember, and we blocked it out for a full 90 minutes because there's a full slate of, uh, of speakers and, uh, and fellows for that. So that's going to be great. And then my last announcement is a little bit of a fun one. And this is a cause shout out to David in particular, who's been working so hard on this, but we're going to be able to officially um, upgrade the, the tech in our two main classrooms at the workshop, both in Tocqueville um, and in the Ostrom rooms over the summer. Um, so starting when we, when we can physically come back and kind of a staggered way here, but starting, starting then we'll be uh, benefiting from a lot of cool new um, opportunities to continue to do these hybrid uh, events, hopefully quite well and even more seamlessly than we have in the past, including a massive 95 inch TV in the Tocqueville room. Holy crap, right? So uh, we'll, we'll open it up to Super Bowls from here on out. Um, so 98, Scott. 98. Is it 98? Thank you for chiming in, David. I mean, if it's 95, why bother? You know, but yeah, no, that that's so that that's going to be epic. Um, so we're excited about some of those uh, facilities updates and upgrades. Um, and thanks again, David, for all your hard work on that. So those are just a couple of quick announcements. Without further ado, um, Angie, let me turn things over to you to properly introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Seth Fry. Hello, everyone. I am incredibly proud to welcome Seth Fry uh, back to the workshop, quite honestly. Um, he's a cognitive scientist and computational social scientist who studies uh, human decision behavior in complex social environments, which, of course, you'll hear about today. Um, he's currently a professor of communications at UC Davis. But probably most importantly to a whole group of us on the call, he's an active affiliate with the Ostrom Workshop and does some really important work um, considering the Ostroms and the framework in relation to these self-governing communities. Uh, Seth and I were talking prior to this and I, I did mention to him that he would certainly be on my short list to invite to campus uh, next year as soon as we can open things up because I think Seth, if you haven't met him, uh, the opportunity to network with him while he's on campus is just so important. So I hope you agree with me. His conversation today will be about emergence of integrated institutions and large population of self-governing communities. I think you'll find this a very interesting paper. So Seth, I'd like to turn it over to you. As always, I will keep the cue for questions um, and get you unmuted and all those things as we move through uh, the paper today. Seth has also agreed to stay after as usual if uh, anyone has some specific conversations that we want to have after the colloquium presentation. So Seth, please take it away. What a generous introduction. Thank you so much, Angie. Thanks all for having me. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from the format. I will discuss the results of the paper, but I'm really more interested in, in painting the larger arc of the opportunity of going to online communities because uh, uh, because it's now possible to compare hundreds of thousands of institutions and, and scale up the quality of comparative institutional analysis. And that's something I'm really, uh, really excited about um, uh, for, for, for um, both to spread it and also for personal goals. So um, I discovered when I when I discovered the workshop as a as a graduate student, I was an organizer for a housing cooperative uh, in Bloomington, Bloomington Cooperative Living. They've now got two houses they own, they self-govern. And I would bring literature from the workshop um, to the to house meetings 
um, to, you know, uh, oh, this is what it says about keeping the kitchen sink clean, you know, the sort of mundane everyday comments that by learning to govern them amongst ourselves, by, by having the practice of uh, self-governance, we learn um, uh, leadership and we learn um, uh, political empowerment, economic empowerment, uh, and we learn to, to build stuff and change stuff. Um, and, it, and I had transformative experiences in uh, you know running, participating, building um, uh, small uh, amateur run resource management systems. And, uh, but I also experienced how difficult it was and how much literature can help and research can help, especially once I discovered the workshop, that there's a way to study, to do science on communities. Um, and that was transformative for me and, I, and, I, and I've taken it um, uh, maybe in, a, in an unexpected direction, really online. Where there's a where there's a frontier right now, uh, there's a, so so let's talk about this. So if I'm a, I'm trained as a cognitive scientist, when I want to do science on a human, um, I should probably get a couple hundred. I'll bring them into the lab and I'll uh, in a very controlled environment and I'll do science on them. Now, uh, so I've, I've I've transitioned more and more in the in the social science where my unit of analysis is the society is a, is a social system. Um, and so um, to answer all the big questions in social science, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Here's what you need. Uh, you wanna take the earth, all of it, um, its whole history. Uh, you should double it. Um, and of course have perfect control over both. And then um, just change one thing uh, in one of them and replay all of human history so that we can capture all the complex interdependencies um, and everything that sort of happened in a properly controlled setting. Now, unfortunately, this is uh, impossible. And so maybe we shouldn't even bother um, doing uh, science at the unit of analysis of the social system, which of course includes resource management systems. Um, uh, but uh, um, because you need, so it's not normally part of, of contr like controlled experimental science, uh, uh, social science. Uh, because you just need a lot of controls that are far-fetched. Nevertheless, some folks have been undaunted. Um, a really uh, common approach in the workshop community has been meta-analysis, um, uh, governing commons. I don't know the numbers. But how uh, I've never seen like the database that governing the commons was built on. I've tried to look for it, um, but I, I understand it's about maybe 300 um, sort of ethnographic papers were sort of uh, more or less systematically um, uh, compared in order to sort of come up with the design principles. I've never found it written, a number of, uh, of this has a database. Could anyone help me out? Well, some, some old timers, maybe if you can stick around, I'd love to hear. Uh, additionally, we've got the, the, the IFRI program was a big structured um, database. Uh, the, the, the Nepal program had about 200 sites and everything memorable out of the workshop comes from these really large, uh, large scale multi-site comparative institutional analyses. Um, uh, and, and, and by the standards of what's typically possible in this field, in a very case dominated field, an ethnographic dominated field, hundreds is gigantic. And this is, uh, and, and this is what, uh, a major, you know, this is why, the workshop's work has been memorable because they, there were several gigantic comparative studies. However, by the standards of what we need um, to, to really go into detail into what works, what institute, what fe general features of institutions lead um, to resource management success in detail that we can really test lots of hypotheses. Hundreds is tiny, it's not, it's not enough. Um, however, there is an opportunity um, to, to go bigger, to add some zeros to the size of the compar comparative institutional analyses we can perform. Um, I have here uh, a, a virtual deforestation in a virtual world. Now, um, virtual trees are not real trees. However, there are um, uh, subtractable, non-excludable resources online, um, in online communities of all types, and I can, I can go into that. Um, and so even if the, there's no literal analogy from virtual tree to physical tree, there is a, a, the theor a, a strong theoretical tie in terms of the general properties of resources that are being managed regardless of where they're being managed. 
Um, so where our, the you know, traditional purview is uh, uh, global um, common pool resources, um, there's uh, analogs of uh, uh, common pool resources, public goods online, all of which merit huge amounts of small scale governance attention from small communities. Um, and, uh, and those communities are, are built by people. They're often built on code and um, that gives them a lot of um, properties. So for one, they're, they're simplified environments. You're almost closer to a lab setting than you are to, uh, to a, a ethnographic setting. Um, you've got um, so a lot of the, the components of the rational agent model are satisfied, clear goals, real challenges, high motivation. You have non undergrad populations, a little bit of generalization. You have highly structured data. You know, um, APIs are um, sort of web browsers for your computer to pull structured data down. Um, and you have uh, tons of data, great, sometimes selection on performance. You can see who's good and who's bad by who's stuck around. And most importantly for me, a, a societal unit of analysis that I have um, 100,000 communities all running the same software so I can collect standardized data about all of them. Nevertheless, they do have enough diversity among themselves to, to show us the variety of ways that communities can, can succeed and fail. Um, so uh, domains that have attracted uh, the interest of my research, um, the paper was about Minecraft, which is a video game. Um, uh, other video games, um, discussion communities. I have a major project right now in the, uh, the Apache Software Foundation, which is building a public good uh, around software that runs the internet, uh, um, fairly literally. Um, uh, uh, Wikipedia and, and some work in, in the crypto area. Uh, starting with Minecraft, the subject of the paper. Actually, you know what? Now would not be the worst time to take a little breather. I don't mind peppering with questions. We don't. We can spread things out. Any questions? Okay, we'll keep moving along then. Um, Minecraft is a video game. If you know about it, it could very well be because there's a there's a, a 20 year old in your life who was 11 um, when it was big. Um, uh, it's, I think it's beautiful. It, was, it stretches infinitely in every direction. There's one uh, um, default administrator and then there's lots of um, members who are sort of logged in. Um, and really um, it's people build inspiring things together like, like scale models of things of personal interest to in them. So they, they build tremendous public goods and in the process they solve a lot of collective action problems. Looking at how they do that, who succeeds and fails gives us insight. And then here's something especially interesting. Uh, this is slightly technical distinction, but it has really big implications on the scientific side. So a traditional way that a video game or an online service is run, you have one company, every dot is a user. And if you're in the red box, then that, that's the server you're logging into. You're logging into corporate run, centralized, professionally run servers. Um, a unique thing about Minecraft and, and other games in the, in the, in the, uh, in that ecosystem is that it's a self-hosted model where you buy the, the client the right to play the game, but you get the server for free, the, the ability to host your own version of this virtual world. Now, if you do that, you gain a tremendous amount of freedom, but you also face a lot of problems. You suddenly have to deal, uh, worry about providing sufficient network bandwidth, sufficient computational CPU and RAM. These all function as common pool resources in the online domain. And of course, virtual resources, bad behavior, um, all kinds of things can go wrong. And so there emerged this ecosystem of governance plugins that, that, that kids can install like flipping switches to customize how their server runs and functions. Um, and, you, and you see, so there's, uh, you can install the idea of private property rights. By default, there's, there's no private property rights. You can install the idea of social hierarchy. You can choose, do I solve problems by preventing bad behavior, by turning off uh, actions that can be used potentially for negative um, behaviors? Or do I focus on remediation, give people the same action space they would normally have, but provide myself excellent tools for undoing damage efficiently and quickly, reverting the previous versions of the world, for example, if someone blows stuff up. Uh, um, so you can install the idea of law enforcement, of, of, of peer monitoring, of top-down monitoring, automated monitoring, uh, and, and seeing the, 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 the dishes 
that, that, that young people are preparing from this a la carte menu of potential plugins gives us a sense of people's folk theory of effective governance. And then seeing how that plays out in terms of building a successful community, uh, which I operationalize in the paper of success. Um, let's us see, well, uh, the distance between that folk theory of successful self-governance and, and what actually uh, uh, systematically leads to success. Um, the results, um, you know, from scanning 300,000 servers, the, the papers on, uh, on a especially clean 5,000 of them, um, uh, 50 million visits by 10 million players over two years, um, uh, you're able to say, well, first, most communities are smaller and successful. This uh, diagram is a little hard to parse. So let me just say um, success as we're defining it is along this upper diagonal. So most communities um, fail in this bottom, in these uh, bottom eight cells to, to about two thirds fail to get any um, regular visitors at all. And then uh, this upper triangle is some level of success and the biggest level of success um, is along this diagonal. This is number of people who visit your community at least once a week for a month um, compared to your, the, your target, your desired goal for that number of, of people. Um, and we're able to find um, there's diversity in the kinds of things that get managed. Are you managing bad behavior, physical resources, or virtual resources? And there's variety in the kinds of uh, approaches you take to manage those resources. Do you govern by installing more communication tools, more information broadcast tool, more exchange mechanisms, or by further uh, empowering the administrator? And um, the arrows are, are the statistically significant result. There's a lot of focus on uh, empowering the administrator over other types of governance. And there's inordinate attention to managing bad behavior. Although um, there's a striking effect of the importance of managing physical resources, um, both on size and on what I call success. Um, mere count of rules turns out to be surprisingly important and predictive. Um, much more than which specific rules seem to be getting installed. And this seems to, to favor uh, ideas of institutional diversity out of the workshop that are further favored um, by more general metrics I came up with for measuring institutional diversity in terms of diversity over, are you using a mix of types of solutions? Are you solving a mix of types of problems? And we were able to find slightly ambiguous results around um, the diversity of problems you're trying to solve and the uh, diversity of ways you're trying to solve those problems. Uh, another domain I'm focusing on a lot right now is Reddit. Reddit is a discussion community. People write rules, people with no training who are more interested in other things. Um, they're not interested in governance, they're interested in shower thoughts, right, or memes. Uh, but uh, in order to engage a community in those subjects, they have to physically write rules and they don't have training in that. Uh, um, with some really amazing colleagues who I admire a lot, we're developing um, computational tools for automating the encoding of these written rules in the institutional grammar framework developed by um, uh, uh, Crawford and Ostrom, uh, 95. Uh, and it's really seeing a resurgence, especially with these tools. Um, now, there's over a million um, subreddits uh, uh, of these um, Reddit discussion communities, um, about 100,000 of which have written rules. Uh, we can see all, all enforcement actions. Um, we can see um, moderator actions. We can see measure all kinds of community characteristics. We see we can see everything. We have this level of transparency over the inner workings and the governance outcomes, not just structure, but outcomes that that just gives unprecedented um, ability to do large scale comparative institutional analysis. Um, we're able to see um, uh, compare across domains. Um, that there, there um, does seem to be uh, an effect, again, of rule count with, um, with success or size. Um, uh, we see, uh, we're able to see what types of rules um, are written. I got written rules out of Minecraft, out of another domain called World of Warcraft. It's another video game and Reddit. And we're able to see rough consistency, much heavier lines and norms than, than rules or strategies. Um, oh, I didn't put all my other plots. We also see, um, I think that there, there's subtle differences. It's hard to tell how interpretable these are, but you can always make stuff up. Um, and this is, of course, as far as the Institutional Grammar Research Initiative, NSF funded uh, project um, led by the amazing Sub Siddiqui and a whole bunch of other people, including um, several uh, workshoppers. 
Uh, another area I'm focusing right now is the Apache Software Foundation. This is sort of more serious. Apache, uh, like I uh, alluded to earlier, runs the internet. There's a famous piece of software and it's open source, which means volunteers are writing their own software. Um, uh, it's the, when we're not talking hundreds of thousands or millions of communities, we're in the low hundreds. Um, but you can see they're sort of all here. I don't have to get 100 plane tickets. Um, I can write a script that downloads everything. And the values of the Apache Software Foundation are such that all in, like um, important decision making happens on public listservs. So we're able to download all code. It's open source code, all code contributions, who contributed what. We're able to see um, every bit of important discussion, every vote. Um, we have the written rules of the Apache Software Foundation, and we have the functional rules of every community. Um, there's an incubator program that, that uh, another large NSF grant is focused around with two other workshoppers, Charles Schweik and Brenda Bushouse, and computer scientist Vladimir Filkov here at UC Davis, where we are uh, combining socio-technical analysis, social network structures, and on code contributions to uh, institutional grammar and other workshoppy type frameworks for merging institutional and organizational style perspectives on open source software self-governance. Um, uh, again, merging the text of discussions, social network structures, code contributions, to look at the tension between um, the, the, the foundations rule systems and the, and the foundations way with the, the very diverse makeup of individual rules that projects begin with before they're fully onboarded into the Apache Software Foundation. Their motivation being that the Apache Software Foundation provides um, legal support uh, and other kind of administrative um, stuff that helps an open source community out a lot in exchange for adopting very specific governance practices. So we get to watch uh, communities intentionally evolve their governance style towards this standard. We get to see them succeed and fail. Um, there's uh, about 300 projects that have gone through this onboarding, pro this formal onboarding process. Uh, um, many fail, many succeed, and we can look at the at the characteristics um, predicting that. Um, the last, this is this is meta. This is the community of people who have uh, um, become one of my other homes. It's a group of <laughs> journalists, computer scientists, uh, developers. Um, uh, um, and anarcho-capitalists uh, uh, who are really excited about Ostrom uh, literature, who are really excited about um, general governance frameworks, and who are excited about applying all of that uh, to the to the design of flexible governance systems for online communities. Um, uh, and they've been really transformative and exciting place for me. You're welcome to be uh, to to check it out. Uh, so we're wrapping it all up. Um, I, I wanted to pin this down and make this concrete. That's now possible to compare hundreds of thousands of complex resource management institutions or other resource management institutions and vastly improve the speed and quality of comparative institution scale insights. So that was a bit of a whirlwind, but thank you so much. Hello everyone. I see Jamie has her hand up. And uh, then will the chat is open uh, for questions as well. For those of you who can't unmute, I'm happy always to read questions out loud. But Jamie, would you like to go first? Sure, I'll go ahead. Thank you for such a fascinating um, it, little picture, like large scale view of this really cool work that you're doing. And I love the I love I wanted to tell, say this at the beginning of the colloquium that I just thought your picture is really cool with like the it's almost like that, you know, um, seashell like um, ratio. I forget. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting all my math terms now. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, so I've got a couple of questions and one is related kind of specifically to your work. And the other one is just a broader question. Um, so because I saw that um, about your experience here at the workshop. So the question about your work is related to this idea of, so you're talking about coding and working with codes. And I'm curious, do you find that um, like this idea of symbolism and certain codes meaning certain things or certain words, do they become symbolic within these types of communities? Of course, I'm asking that question because Vincent Ostrom was grappling this idea, right? If a word can be a symbol that captures so much. So that's my first question. Are you running into that in your own work? And the second one is, 
Um, looking back on your time as a PhD student here at IU Bloomington, how would you, what advice would you give to your former self as to how um, to most take, best take advantage of the opportunities that you had while in the workshop? Oh goodness, okay. Um, 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 the workshop was uh, a, a whirlwind. Um, I don't think I spent nearly enough time there. My, my home was in PBS. I was, I was a lurker, um, but I, I, I was able to develop connections that have, that have proven to be lasting. It took a while to um, uh, a tran uh, transition to a point where now all of, I, uh, nearly everything I do uh, with, uh, with the exception of some sort of pet classic, more classic cognitive science projects that I still dearly love, uh, most of my work is um, using workshop tools uh, for really big online data sets. Um, uh, it was a little terrifying of a transition. And I think one thing that uh, graduate student teaches, grad school taught me, um, hey, hey Seth, here's some scraps of string, um, some old wire, um, uh, some crumpled up paper, do something neat, make something pretty cool with that. Uh, and one thing I had to learn, um, actually my, a brief amount of time I had in the corporate world helped me out a lot with this, is, hey Seth, um, uh, here's all the resources. I mean, if you had all the resources in the world, what's just the coolest thing possible to do ever? Uh, and um, uh, it took me a while, both to just imagine thinking that way, and second to accept that I was worthy to think that way, that, that, um, that, that, I, that I could do that. Uh, um, but that's really the scale necessary um, in order to do, to, I don't know, to, we have tremendous, more intellectual freedom than any profession. We, it's, it's, it's our job to think completely differently and do things completely that are new and undoable. So we, we specialize in the impossible uh, and, and, the, and the inadvisable. Uh, and so I feel like a professional obligation to, to try to take that on. Um, and, and only with that scale of thinking can I do work that I think is, is worthy of the, um, the legacy um, that had a tremendous influence on me, which is the workshop. Um, the, you're, you're more, uh, so when I say code, I'm mostly talking about programming, uh, like, like Python scripts and R scripts, but um, nevertheless, I am uh, super interested and I see a huge opportunity um, to look at the interaction of what I'm going to call formal rules, um, what, what maybe written rules, um, or literal uh, rules encoded in code. You have a lot of automatic enforcement. Uh, you're able to automate huge amounts of, especially monitoring, because you have ac full access to state to the entire state of the system. There's, uh, there's not often observability problems for a moderator. Um, uh, and, but there's, but there's interact, you know, the, the lesson of 20th century international development is you can't copy paste democracy. Uh, and, and similarly, you can't just take the rules that work in this community and paste them into that one. There's interactions between rules and culture. And there, because we have access to raw text and, and revolutions in natural language processing, there are ways to, um, come up with quantitative representations of culture, not to quantify culture, but to but to uh, analyze the shadow the quantitative shadow cast by culture. So it's 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 more simple, it's lower dimensional, it's artificial. Nevertheless, it's a proxy, uh, and we can start to ask questions around. Well, what's the what's the cultural tender that's going to catch the spark of these rules uh, or not? And how can we uh, understand the better understand that deep interdependency? So when you say codes that kind of go in the direction of culture, what are the, the spontaneous emergent meanings that this community has developed, the special vocabulary? That's where constitutive rules come in. You can see communities defining new words um, that are the basis of their enforcement down the line. And so that, that it may perhaps that gets at your question. Does that do it for you, Jamie? Yeah, actually, um, and that's really interesting because I'm I'm thinking a lot about culture actually, and, and that aspect that's sort of under underdeveloped but very important to the those, yeah. you know to the workshop um, thinking. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jess is next. All right, awesome. Thanks, Angie, and um, <clears throat> and thanks, Seth. Uh, I found this really interesting as well. My question has to do with the relationship between the success of the community and the rule number and the number of humans participating. 
I, you said at the beginning of the presentation, I, I gleaned from the paper that you're really thinking about success as sort of um, whether there's a specific number of visitors that or a number of people that visit like once a month or sorry, once a week for at least a month, right? Yeah. And one thing I'm sort of trying to parse out is in your paper, and I apologize, I didn't get all the way through it. It sounded um, like you were taking a, a bit of a functionalist approach, essentially that people come up with the rules that they need to meet the challenges that they face. But at the same time, I'm not really sure. It also seemed like you were suggesting that while that essentially as, as the community grew, more rules were developed. And yet at the same time, having more rules, right, seemed to shape the likelihood of success of the community, which is yeah. also the number of people that regularly visit. So I guess I'm okay with feedbacks, right? This is a complex yeah. situation, but I am curious as to how you're thinking about that somewhat endogenous relationship there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you really focusing on the extent to which in order to get more people, you really need to regulate your community well with more and more rules or the dimension of like, as you get more people, the need for more and more rules arises and there are more and more people participating and so could actually generate more and more rules given the nature of these communities, right? Um, those, while they could both be going on, are somewhat different processes, and I'm sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. How you're thinking about them. Yeah. Um. Uh. So. Uh. Yeah. Uh, let me say it before anyone else does. Um. This is not a con controlled study. I do kind of make a case for for a causal direction, but ultimately that's unjustified. Um. This is a correlational study. Um. Uh. And yes, there's really good reason to to. Uh. So yeah, what's merited is one thing. Um. The claim of, yeah, I think we're operating under the same framework of, uh, of feedback, more rules, uh, you know, better or more, or, you know, in this case, more rules uh, causes better community and better community um, could, could conceivably cause more rules. Um, uh, I do, this was paper one of what was supposed to be, you know, a huge amount of stuff. Um, I'm still working on it. Um, we, there is opportunity to get more causal and do get closer to um, actual or simulated uh, counterfactuals and, and get more rigorous causal insights. We were able to do this um, with uh, a there's a follow up analysis with a with a student of mine where we we're able to um, you have self selection between communities. So we were able to build the network of communities in terms of who migrates from this Minecraft server to that Minecraft server. And of course we have the, the governance now, the profile of governance plugin types that communities are going. And so we're able to get a little bit closer um, uh, um, with some complex network analysis tools. Uh, is it the self-selection that tends to be followed by rule changes or is it rule changes that tend to be followed by um, uh, 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 increases in self-selection. And we're able to find overall a uh, seemingly uh, much stronger effect of changing rules influencing the composition in my community rather than the composition in my community changing my rules. Um, again, this is not a controlled experiment. This is uh, um, more uh, analytical or statistical causal inference. Um, so, you know, <laughs> caveat, 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 asterisk, 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 but uh, um, you're right, it's not enough to say feedback, you need to look, you know, what's the relative strength of these feedback effects, are they symmetrical, is one driving the other more seemingly, and we were able to see um, a, a quite strong directional effect, I'd be happy to share that. Could I just two finger really quickly? Great. It, it, are you also looking at whether individuals and you can see when individuals leave and join another community, you could also hypothetically see whether they're carrying over rules from other communities to their new communities, right? So you could see if they were like, I don't know. Um, you can, you can, we could, that's something I think we could see in Reddit where the rules are written. In the case of Minecraft, there's like a, essentially like a free market of 20,000 plugins or so. Um, and everyone's, and there are some, you know, there's definitely a sort of fat tail kind of distribution. There's some that everyone uses, um, but I, I'm not able to see peer-to-peer um, -peer mimicry. It's kind of more, um, uh, slightly more, yeah, yeah. If you installed this, I don't know who, who you were watching that you took it from. Did that answer your question, Jess? Yeah, yeah, I have an interest in behavioral spillover, so I was curious as to whether ah, to talk later about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Gustavo, go. Gustavo? 
Okay, hi. Um, very very interesting presentation. So I I was thinking uh, in the following. It's, um, so you are interested in the um, institutions that essentially uh, emerge uh, as coordinating these self-governing communities, no? And I was thinking to what extent those uh, institutions that emerge at the uh, meta level are essentially uh, just the extreme cases, either levy atom, just basic rules established by the developer, or um, just pure market-based full decentralization is like uh, each community can do whatever they want, okay? So essentially, um, my point is, are you finding that essentially self-governing is working within this community, but the uh, meta institution that is connecting all these communities is not self-governance, or what I'm saying is completely wrong, okay? Uh, and, and it's an open question, so it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, so uh, it's, it's a real question. And maybe I'm playing a little bit the devil's advocate here, but um, that's, uh, that's what I have in mind, no? Uh, I'm not completely sure I understand the question. Let me try to say it back to you. You're asking, um, so there's a couple levels going on. There's each individual community, and then there's sort of potential linkages between those communities. And you're asking, um, uh, maybe you're saying, um, Seth, I only heard you looking within community. I don't see you looking between communities um, in terms of potential meta-level governance. Is that, did that yes. capture what you're after? Correct, because otherwise I don't understand what you mean by integrated institutions in large populations. So I we see. know that the communities are really small. Mm -hmm. So what are you talking about this interaction of these mm -hmm. communities and the institutions yeah. that rule that interactions? It seems that if you're talking about that, they are not self-governance at all. Sure. Um, uh, or otherwise, maybe I, I misunderstood what you mean by the emergence of integrated institutions. And sure. that's, that's the part that I'm not really following. That's yeah, the, that, uh, I think there's a couple of things going on. Um, uh, first, I wanted to distinguish the Minecraft case from, say, the Apache case. In the Apache case, you have lots of self-governing uh, um, projects that are under a larger self-governing umbrella. So you really, it's a really beautiful case of um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, data transparent, data rich federalism kind of case study. Uh, in the Minecraft case, you have something closer to a market for tyrants. So um, uh, um, uh, communities compete for users. They all have a, a single um, dictator uh, by default, um, but you might be able to use a sort of libertarian uh, or market argument to say that, that market pressure is that competition for citizens um, imposes some pressure on dictators to at least act as if they're benevolent. And there's some literature for this. I think some cool um, Brazilian anti-corruption law work showing that um, when you add anti-corruption law, it's not that the bad people are replaced by good people, it's the bad people start acting less bad, as if they're good. Um, yeah. So that's some theoretical kind of assumptional foundation. The key difference in what you're after and what I'm describing is when I say integrated, I'm not talking about integration. When I say integrated institutions, I'm not talking about integration between institutions. I'm talking about the integration of a single institution. So I come from a very micro world. You know, my PhD work was six people in the lab playing rock, paper, scissors and starting to flock around. And, and so my training was around these very toy systems where you have one thing essentially being managed and how do people manage that thing? And there's a really giant gap. There's a huge bridge between that, these little toy systems where one thing's being managed to real world governance systems where uh, in a forest, um, uh, uh, there's, there's people um, uh, getting uh, scrap wood, uh, digging for roots, chopping trees down. There's lots of things that have to get managed. And when I say integrated, I mean that you don't have a separate institution for each of those, for the deadwood and the, and the lumber and the, and the ginseng. Um, for the for the Bloomington case. Um, no, you have kind of one forest management association that manages all those. It's, and so it's, um, it's one institution that is integrated in the sense of it's managing several related resources or um, uh, resources linked at least by geography, if not in any kind of more, more deep interaction. And so the, the Minecraft case is this funny mix. It's, it's real people doing real stuff, pursuing real personal interests, but it's very artificial. It's almost lab-like. 
in how fake it is and how um, simple and simplified it is. So you actually get an opportunity to look at the transition out of these, uh, a very toy, one resource kind of focused environment up to managing lots of resources under one institutional umbrella. And that, that's what I was going for. Maybe there's a better word for that. I, I chose integrated for lack of something better. Does that address your, your questions or concerns, Gustavo? Yes, thank you very much. I think that clarifies a lot. So um, thank you very much. Brian? OK. Um, neat stuff. And I've read a bunch of the other things, but it was fun to actually read this paper again. So my question is about the provision of these rules and kind of institutional artisanship or social design. The paper very much, particularly, you know, for Minecraft focuses on administrators. So my question is, do other people get involved at all, as far as you can tell, in decisions about adding or changing rules um, within a particular game? And then in the larger community, are these rule plugins mainly again coming from administrators or are there other people or things affecting the provision, you know, the artisanship? Thanks. That's great. Um, uh, so I, I started grad school, I was supposed to be a theorist. I was supposed to be a, um, like a computational kind of theoretical scholar where I would build theories um, about, um, actually it was gonna be brains uh, and, uh, and then they would turn out to be right. And uh, reality very rarely accommodated my preconceptions. Um, that's really the case, and that, that, that continues to be true. I have horrible intuition, and that's why I'm very data focused and data driven. Um, I uh, I love democracy. I have an ideology, ideological kind of inclination towards the hard work of talking to people um, as a route to um, uh, personal, you know, growth and empowerment and community power. Um, so I, so I really went in with the lens of that on Minecraft. Um, and I really had to be told by the data that um, uh, kids love, you know, uh, the people who play these games really like dictatorship. That they really like kind of straight up administrative hierarchy. They're selecting into it. And I found um, uh, no evidence for democracy. I couldn't even find it. It's probably out there. I couldn't find a single case. Of, uh, of a sort of a demo explicitly democratic, kind of formally democratic, um, user-driven um, so form of self-governance. Um, and this way, you, you, I mean, you, we, we could say that invalidates the whole paper. I don't go there. I think there's something you said, I, even if it is one individual designing a governance system, we still gain insight, you know, in their mind, it's self-governance, right? Um, we still gain insight and because these are such informal environments, um, there's still voice, there's still you know, user influence on how things function. That's ubiquitous, you know, you, you, there's no missing that. Um, it's but formal, um, uh, formal provision of power to kind of everybody or a larger net, you don't see. You see a lot of delegation, administrative hierarchy, there's plugins specifically for installing um, a moderator hierarchy so that different people can gain trust and gain different powers within the system. Uh, and, and perhaps they, they gain an influence over decision making, though again, I, I didn't take that route. Um, so that's all within community. But you also are kind of getting into between communities. Um, this is really cool. So one person wrote the game of Minecraft, most of it. Um, he wrote uh, 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 the server as well. Um, people wanted to, to modify the server, but it was um, compiled code, it was ones and zeros. Um, so they decompiled it, which is a sort of technical skill. They decompiled it. So they essentially stole the source code. <laughs> they modified the source code to add what you call hooks, um, which are uh, a design pattern in programming for um, enabling uh, the, a plugin ecosystem, enabling you to install other bits of code that interact with the main code. So essentially what you do to install a general framework for a generally modifiable software system. So the fan community, did the decompiling, installed the hooks, recompiled, created a pirate version of the software that still ran the official client so that they weren't stealing money from the developer and then created um, this emergent market for open source user contributed plugins that use those hooks. They also um, built a, a, um, a way of browsing the whole self-hosted server ecosystem. There's this called a Minecraft server list or a game server list. You look it up and you'll find tens of thousands of servers advertising themselves. 
uh, the, the fan community wrote an API to every server that every server could broadcast to these server lists, which were emergent, how many people are on them, who's coming, what's the network latency. So the, the fan community fully instrumented um, this stolen source code so that they could collaborate, so they could find each other, so they could customize, so they could self-govern, so they could do what they want. Um, and it's a glorious example. So even if there's no sort of mean, meaning, formally meaningful cooperation within the community, there's this mind-blowing um, level of, of uh, cooperation and, uh, and teamwork and openness um, at, the, at the meta scale in terms of the entire ecosystem that was built by the fan community to have more meaningful experiences with the game. Neat. I'll just comment, you know, again, like seeing you cite Hirschman exit voice and loyalty and those kind of checks. And then Vince Nostrum and T-Boot and Warren, you know, people voting with their feet. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, actually one thing I like, so so the polycentricity as it was originally formulated and the way it seems to be getting picked up in the sort of marketer community is um, is sort of trying to generalize a, a sort of capitalist or individual perspective to not just always be about competition, but some, but be equally about spontaneous emergent cooperation. Um, uh, that, and I think the Minecraft case captures that really nicely because you have different scales of things, uh, different scales of services, Minecraft serverless, the plugin thing, the developer community around the server, and, and of course the, the self-hosted player. So you have all these very different kinds of stakeholders with very different kinds of powers and interests, um, uh, self-organizing to build stuff together and, and meet each other's interests and create an, a, a standard, you know? <laughs> Uh, a very different agents, very different interests, uni uniting around um, literal standards. Uh, so I think it's a great uh, uh, case for this understand for this um, understanding of polycentricity. Uh, this sort of more wild west understanding of polycentricity that, that almost treats polycentricity as a generalization of the market. Um, uh, you know, when we're not just interested in competi competition. I have Jamie next, but noting that she's already asked a question, is there anyone that wants to unmute and ask a question? I'll give to the count of five in our heads. Can I say something here? Just, yes. just although you've gone before too. You, you've so, also gone too. <laughs> I was trying to give other people a chance. So, uh, but yes, you can jump in and the next will be Jamie. Don't forget to raise your hands or put in the chat if you do want to jump in. So Gustavo and then Jamie. Just a super brief comment. It's like I think said the, the your answer to Brian uh, highly complement my question. So essentially, th thank you. So that's 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 also very very useful for me. That's it. Perfect. Jamie. Yep. Okay. So I was thinking about you know how you described the the, the way that uh, fans would take take the original code and then create hooks. Um, where they could sort of customize and use their own plugins. Um, and I like the description of the Wild West too, kind of way of, of creating rules to adapt to situations. Um, do you think that there's ways to extrapolate um, some principles of human behavior from what you're observing in this situation, maybe to help us sort of apply that to even political governance? Because I know there are many ways when people, where people don't feel like they have that ability to adapt the, the rules by which we govern ourselves. And, and they feel like they're so distanced from government these days. Do you think that some of the things that you're observing might help reestablish that ability for people to engage with the governments um, that, that they suppose? Uh, so yeah. th that's awesome. So um, I think the most important thing to say is uh, yes, but what I think doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm fairly rare in my community on the tech side, uh, uh, people who study online community, uh, and I'm one of the few who doesn't care about online community, and I'm rare in the, in the community of people who study video games, and that I don't care about video games, I care about general human cooperation, general human institution building, and, you, you, and you, a sympathetic way of looking at what I'm doing is I'm going where people are, managing things that they care about and seeing how they do it. And if they care about games and, and shower thoughts, um, then, then, that's, then that's where I am. And, and I'll look at how they do that. Um, I'm really interested in general insights. Um, one of the most valuable things I came out of the workshop with was the sort of tools for how to generalize, how to make meaningful generalizations. So 
you'll see I kind of do a little bit of a framing thing in the paper where I make the case for sort of Lord of the Flies picture that our, um, our expectation out of the online setting is that it's harder than the real world, at least in the Minecraft case, because it's 13 year olds. And the only political theory we have about self-governance in 13 year olds is the Lord of the Flies, that it'll devolve into murder. Uh, and so if I set the expectation there, then any improvement is even more remarkable than you expect in real life. And therefore we should expect to generalize. You'll see, so I, I filter down from 300,000 servers to 5,000 servers. And I do that anti-conservatively. I, I, I introduce selection bias, but it's, um, it's uh, conservative selection bias in the sense that I only throw away servers that are more likely to validate my kind of preconceptions. And I end up with the most conservative subset. So that's a data analysis trick. And we have like a rhetorical trick essentially uh, towards a general case to, to attract the interest of people who don't study online community, to attract the interest of, of, of you all. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I still haven't been cited by anyone who studies forests or fisheries or pastures. Um, and uh, um, I can only do so much, but that's, I mean, that's the goal. That's what general looks like is to add online to the sort of canon of major um, uh, um, resource systems in the lives of humans. Um, and there's all kinds of problems with that. Um, <laughs> uh, it's certainly not an even slice of humans like forest management is, um, not as even a slice of humans as forest management is. Nevertheless, um, um, as a, a tool in the toolbox and as a domain with its own strengths, um, not just its unique characteristics, but its potential to advance the science. Um, uh, um, I, I, I'm, I, this is old work that I'm sharing. I'm not sharing my most recent work, but, uh, and I've hit this, and people have seen these slides before, and I've hit this, uh, this anvil before, um, but, um, but towards, um, selling the, the general potential of these domains. I'm doing it again and I'm using this form to do it again because I, I think that's really worth repeating. So I'm glad that you're, you seem sympathetic to that and that's very validating. Does that, did that get your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. We have a couple more minutes. If anyone has uh, another question or a follow-up, there is currently no one in the queue. Okay. Hi. Uh, I just, oh, go ahead. This is a uh, is really interesting stuff. Thanks for sharing. I'm uh, um, I'm coming at this as a practitioner, working with a lot of communities that are trying to that whether they understand it or not are are grappling with governance problems, and um, especially in the open source software world, but but also in like the wild west of <clears throat> data management. There's very little in the way of cultural precedent for understanding governance as a system. Um, and so my interest in all in the Ostrom's workshop is not just understanding how systems do work, but helping people think about how systems could work. And are you able to speak to the prospect of essentially education and 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 practical uh, pedagogy around these ideas? Like like how can how can we take these research frameworks and analysis frameworks and help people? make better decisions about, about institutional design looking forward rather than just looking backwards. That's great. Um, uh, I really like that you're, you're asking not just how do, I, how do I use literature to do stuff, but um, how do I use the literature to come up with new ways to do stuff? Um, and how do, I, uh, uh, under, how do I use it to understand the most general design space and go beyond kind of the familiar existing patterns? Um, uh, but overall, I'm a disappointment to practitioners, and I still think a lot of the science is. Um, I told you that I would bring literature to my house meetings to talk about uh, whether we should use rewards or punishments to keep the kitchen sink clean. What I didn't tell you is that nobody cared, and for good reason. Um, so much decisions that came out of my community, um, they, they weren't about meeting the design principles. They weren't about meeting these conditions. And, and, and the success of a proposal wasn't about its sort of institutional structure or architecture. What it came down to was like, who is at the meeting or who is sick? Who is in a bad mood? Um, which personalities clashed? Whose baggage came up first? And it was, it was like driven so much more by psychology than institutional like science and so much more by immediate circumstance than, um, than, than, than principle or science or, or, or anything I could offer. And so um, uh, that was an illustration to me of how far, I mean, 
uh, of how far the, in my opinion, the science, even the workshops the science is from being able to be helpful. Uh, I still have so much more to learn from you than, than I think you do from me, um, except uh, insofar as I've seen lots of cases. And I can tell you things I've seen that have failed, but sometimes work and things I've seen that work, but sometimes fail. Uh, so it's overall pretty useless. Um, I think we're still, um, it's just so case driven that my sense of what's possible, my sense of the design space continues to come more from talking to practitioners than it does from kind of theoretical possibilities. And I think that practice is different enough from theory um, that practitioners are more to be trusted around practice and what's possible than theory. I have a little too much faith that the way things are done um, that that things are done the way they're done because that's a good way to do things. Um, I'm I'm often kind of constrained by by um, the observed, uh, and so I really get energized by people who are thinking more about the possible, more ready to untether themselves from the way things are done. But when it comes to just on the ground building organization, you know. There's something you said for hierarchy, right? There's something you said for bureaucracy. I'm a huge fan of bureaucracy. I mean, for as far as as democratic, uh, uh, as people as as people who care about democracy go, I'm a huge fan of bureaucracy, administration, Robert's rules, and all that boring stuff. Um, I think it exists for a reason. I'd love to see, and I am seeing, I am seeing really viable alternatives to it, but not because of the, not because of me, and not not because of stuff I've learned out of the workshop, but overwhelmingly because of, of experiments that practitioners are doing. Um, uh, I, I might be being too humble, right? I might be really downplaying the science. Um, uh, this is really my empirical orientation coming out that I'm, I'm a much better observer than theorist. Um, so I don't wanna be too disappointing and I'd love for someone to disagree with me, honestly, um, but that's where I'm at. Did that, did that um, properly disappoint you? Was that? <laughs> That's what I expected. Uh, <laughs> okay, great, great, great. That was great, Greg. Oh, yeah, Scott, I was going to. Oh, no, you're good, Angie. No, I, I just had a really quick comment. Seth, first off, great, great talk. I, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I'm just putting a quick site to your last point on kind of the theory. Um, that could, could be interesting. I'm not sure if you've run across Andrew Murray's work before he's at LSC, right? And I, in the last chapter of this book that I wrote a couple of years ago, I, I dealt a little bit with um, his work on these Lockean online communities versus, you know, the kind of the more Rousseau, you know, approach and to the extent that some of these platforms like Facebook is trying to create this interesting hybrid with their new content moderation board. Um, so anyway, it could be kind of an interesting scaffolding, you know, to consider if you wanted to get a little bit more on the theory side. Mm -hmm. And then just two practical points. Um, one is we do now have a, uh, a, a representative from this community on the on the board of the workshop itself with Craig Newmark. He's really interested in funding this kind of work. Um, uh, so anyway, sorry, when you say this. Interested, What's so this? Th th so th these type of big meta studies looking at kind okay, of great, knowledge great, commons great. communities. That's like his bread and butter. Um, uh -huh. So if, if you or others on the call are kind of interested in undertaking some more ambitious projects, I'm happy to be kind of like a, like a go-between, you know what I mean, to help with that introduction. Um, and also we do have Eli Sugarman, who is, uh, he's, he's heading up part of Facebook's content moderation board as a guest speaker coming up. Um, we might not get to it at the end of the spring since there's so many events, it might be first off the bat in the fall. Uh, but if you or others are looking for that, you know, kind of connection as well to see how some of this is playing out, um, in practice, I, I'd be happy to make that connection too. But anyway, I love this stuff. This has been really, really helpful. So thank you. Thanks for all those resources. Uh, we are at time and I see no other questions in the queue. So I am going to officially call this to an end and thanks Seth as always for a wonderful conversation. This is an amazing uh, number of people. We haven't seen this this many for a while. So thank you very much. A reminder, Seth has agreed to hang out if anyone has other questions or wants to just say hi, quite honestly. Um, we'll leave this open for a bit of time, but that will end the formal presentation uh, for today. And again, thank you, Seth. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for having me. Eager to stick around. <laughs>